This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 584, recorded on January 24th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And I know we're in a little bit of a hurry because of a guest, so I'll just say it's lovely weather, 47 Fahrenheit, 8C, light breeze, and uh, mostly sunny. From southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 3C, overcast, and that's... Uh, something else in Fahrenheit, 36 Fahrenheit. <laughs> something else, all right. <laughs> and from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 64 Fahrenheit, 18C, sunny skies. It's beautiful. Nice. Nine degrees C and sunny here. Finally got above zero. Our guest today joining us for the fourth time from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Ralph Barrick. Welcome back. Hello, Vincent. How are you? We are it, well. I don't know what the temperature is here, but it is Carolina blue skies and a lovely day. Very nice. Cool. It's probably warmer than here. Right, let me ask you this. You wearing short sleeves? Yes, I am. There you go. I think you do it all year round, though, right? <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, it's time for Ralph. Uh, well, actually, we've had you three other times, which we're not doing outbreaks, right? That's correct. I think this is my first outbreak. That's this is your first outbreak. So eventually we'll hit it. And as everyone knew, we talked uh, two weeks ago about the new coronavirus in China, and we want to get you on to talk about it and uh, see what's going on. Last week we put up a, an episode about virus hunters. That was pretty timely, Rich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, just well. We had three guys from Galveston. Talking about discoveries. And so here we are in the midst of a, a new virus. So, Ralph, um, we have a bunch of questions for you, but let me just throw it to you and you can just start with your uh, impressions of what's going on so far. Uh, coronavirus, coronaviruses are a group of uh, large positive strand RNA viruses. In the 21st century, there have been three new emerging human coronaviruses starting in 2003 with SARS coronavirus. 2012 with um, Middle East respiratory coronavirus, and now in 2019 with a uh, kissing cousin of SARS coronavirus that's called uh, 2019 novel coronavirus. In addition, there have been three novel swine coronaviruses that have emerged in the 21st century. So coronaviruses seem to be a group of uh, viral pathogens on the move. Wow, you sound like you've been on TV shows lately. (laughs) <laughs> not to be that was an excellent excellent summary it's great because usually with scientists you know we go on but that was pretty succinct so this started in december is that right that's right around december 12th was the first case um they had somewhere around 40 41 cases by the uh, end of the year that had been reported um that had stayed relatively static uh, through about the 12th to 15th of January when the number of cases started to increase. And I believe we're at 845 cases with 26 deaths. Uh, about 30% of the cases are what are considered severe, um, perhaps resulting in acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a end-stage lung disease um, or very complex viral pneumonia end-stage lung disease that is very difficult to treat. And clinically manage. And these people who have had serious illness, most of them, is it correct, or have other issues with their health? The reports that have come out have indicated two trends. One trend is that most are in the elderly. Most of the deaths are in the elderly. Mm-hmm. And that's a signature of a SARS coronavirus for sure. So SARS in 2003 caused an overall mortality rate of 10%. But if you were below 21 years of age, um, very few people had any measurable or serious disease that resulted in mortality. Mm -hmm. But if you were over 65, the mortality rate was 50%. MERS follows a a similar trend with about a 70% mortality if you're above 65. And it looks like the majority of patients that that have succumbed from infection so far 
have been over 65. Now, it's not uncommon if you're over 65 to have additional comorbidities, uh, chronic lung disease, uh, diabetes, uh, and other factors, uh, chronic heart disease that contribute that can contribute to uh, increased mortality rates. And at this particular moment, that seems to be the case, although I, I think this is still very early in the outbreak. Now, during during the SARS outbreak, um, China ultimately received quite a bit of criticism, um, probably justified criticism, for trying to keep it quiet, um, not reporting a lot of information. How has this unfolded? Uh, are are you satisfied with the amount of information that the Chinese authorities are releasing so far? Uh, so um, there's some things that have the Chinese have done. I think that is that have been extremely positive. Uh, so for example, they were fairly quick to announce that it was a novel coronavirus, um, although they said it was very distant from SARS, which is true, but it is in the SARS family. Uh, by the uh, 9th or 10th of January, they um, published this full-length genome sequence of about five different isolates, uh, which was incredibly valuable to the entire global health community because this would then allow rapid development of diagnostic tests to uh, evaluate travelers who may be coming from China who would have fevers. And so this would work uh, very positively to limit the rate of spread across the globe. So those, I think, are, are very good and uh, important uh, um, positive things you can say about the response. I think the Chinese virology community, uh, certainly those in the Institute of Virology in Wuhan, who I know, uh, and in the CDC, have been um, very much, uh, have, very, have, have um, clearly demonstrated that they are among the forefront of um, uh, experts in virology globally. Uh, they have responded very quickly. There's a number of papers that are coming out that are describing the disease pathology, the transmission, and the biology of the virus, and um, most importantly, uh, the transmission uh, um, methods that uh, seem to be occurring in, in the expanding outbreak. So those are all positive things. I think some of the the, the, the less positive things um, uh, there was uh, uh, certainly a, um, a strong, concerted uh, series of statements that argued that this virus was less pathogenic than SARS, and it does seem to be appear to be a little less pathogenic than SARS. Um, and um, um, the statement that uh, there was no evidence of person-to-person -person spread. Uh, so, right. um, a paper came out in Lancet that described a family cluster uh, where the I think the wife was infected around the 29th of December. And by the 4th of January, um, most of the, the immediate family had become infected with the virus. That's an example of a family cluster with a lot of person-to-person -person spread. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, they're paying the price for that. Um, I think there's, uh, you know, just by looking at the internet stories and, and what people are saying on the internet, there's a fair amount of frustration by the Chinese people in terms of the local government response and um, the uh, accuracy of information that had been provided to the public. Um, right. That's always a, a double-edged sword because as a governmental official, you don't want to um, be overly to overly drive a concern in the public. Uh, you don't want to cause panic. You don't want to cause um, um, people to flee or to um, cause economic collapse in a city. So uh, there's certainly a desire to try to control the information flow. But at the same time, um, you have to provide out, you have to provide accurate information and um, uh, certainly, the quarantine of 32 million people um, indicates that they probably were a little too cautious in uh, informing both public health officials nearby as well as the community as a whole that this was a serious this was a s serious pathogen that needed immediate attention. So, so the the travel has been restricted. In uh, in a, in and out of Wuhan, I think it's certainly out of Wuhan. They've essentially, yeah. from the reports I've seen, they've essentially locked down the city or tried to. They've uh, locked down. And, 
they've locked down the province. About right. 10 cities, 10 cities in that location, over 32 million people. And I don't know how familiar you are with Wuhan. Wuhan is a central hub for trains in uh, China. So, uh, for example, the day before they closed the trains in China, almost 400,000 people were moving in and out of the city via train. What's your perspective on that, on that measure? I and mean, that strikes right. me as, I mean, a boy, that's a tough decision, it seems to me, because that's, that's a huge lockdown. Well, I think one of the, one of the um, key set of, sets of information that you want to pay attention to is um, the types of spread of infection that occur within the community. So let's take a step back to SARS. The expanding SARS outbreak was almost exclusively associated with hospitals and hospital-acquired infections. And so, in essence, hospitals were acting as amplifying hubs for the expanding epidemic. In MERS coronavirus, the same events occurred in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where hospital infections led to infection of healthcare workers and other individuals in the emergency room that led to an expanding epidemic. In the case of SARS, uh, almost anyone infected with the virus had serious disease. And so, um, and they also didn't really transmit until about 24 to 36 hours after clinical, severe clinical symptoms began to develop. So, contact tracing and quarantine worked well to control the expanding epidemic. Same thing was evident with MERS with a caveat. In the case of MERS, there were asymptomatic infections and mild infections. And some of those, but not all, could also spread the virus asymptomatically. So while contact tracing could shut down the expanding SARS epidemic in 2003, uh, healthcare officials in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia have had a tough time stopping the MERS outbreak from continuing to sort of trickle along for two reasons. One is constant introduction of new viruses from camels into people, person-to-person uh, -person spread in um, hospital or in family settings, and then this sort of underground trickle of uh, asymptomatic spread that is almost impossible to track. So now we move to 2019. <clears throat> uh, the initial reports uh, argued, and there's some data that just came out in Lancet that suggests that this is true, that not all individuals infected with the 2019 virus developed severe disease. In fact, only about 30% uh, develop uh, what is considered severe life-threatening disease. Um, that means that the remaining 7% have a spectrum of disease phenotypes that can range perhaps from mild, and I think there are some examples of children that were infected um, that had mild, almost asymptomatic disease, to uh, mild, moderate disease, uh, conditions that you might not normally be concerned enough about to go to the hospital. So, uh, in that scenario, uh, the 2019 virus has the potential to be much more dangerous. And the reason it could potentially be more dangerous is that you have mild disease, you develop clinical disease, you can spread in family and community settings, um, and uh, this results in community-based outbreaks. And as soon as you move from hospital hubs and a centralized um, a uh, location where that's responsible for the expanding epidemic to uh, community acquired infections in families uh, going to the movies, going to a restaurant, uh, congregating, congregating in parks to listen to music. Uh, suddenly you're moving towards a flu like transmission pattern. And uh, several reports from physicians in China have, have said that this has become a community-acquired outbreak, which means that it's spreading in the communities. So it's very, very different from SARS and MERS, and the threat level goes significantly higher. I wanted to ask if I misunderstood what you said. You thought, I thought I heard you say that the quarantine of 32 million was maybe too cautious. Oh or? no! I, I, well, okay. I don't. I don't. I. I. I am not in a position to say whether it's too cautious or appropriate. Um, okay. I imagine that Chinese health officials uh, know what's going on if, the, if uh, they, they actually have people um, acknowledging that it's community-acquired spread, then um, 
I can understand the desire to uh, prevent people to congregate in in um, in movie theaters and in uh, sports arenas um, and other places of celebration during the new year. Right. So it may be very appropriate. Okay. Uh, whether it's going to work or not is a, a hell of another question. <laughs> but with that said, the the study, yeah, the studies that have been done on quarantines and travel restrictions <clears throat> almost universally suggest that this is a bad idea that what you stimulate then is mass panic and people fleeing for the exits and now you can't even track them because they're doing it by illegal means right uh, like i said um whether or not that's going to work or not no, we right. remains to be seen because <laughs> i mean if i if if i was suddenly in a situation where i was told you know we're shutting down all travel because there's an epidemic in your area I instinctively, I would want to get my family together and flee, right? Well, that's correct. And and China of 2019 is quite different than China of 2003. Many people own cars now. And so the freeways are six lanes going in both directions. And so uh, from what I hear, uh, there is a mass exodus of people leaving uh, Wuhan and some of these other uh, nearby cities uh, by car. Um, so... And again, before they shut down the train stations, 400,000 people leaving the city is a lot of people leaving the city. So um, it's, it's a, it's an, it is a developing into a very dangerous situation in China. Ralph, the, the it's, it's asymptomatic infections, even the incubation period, it's my understanding that, as you said, for SARS, there's very little virus shedding. So do we know? Or are we assuming that now for 2019, we're getting shedding either during incubation or in asymptomatic cases? The Lancet papers came out today. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one was on, on a transmission cohort, and the other was on the first 41 cases of um, disease, going through the disease symptomology. And um, I didn't have time to um, look at the virologic data on these individuals. I assume that uh, they must be shedding virus because they're being diagnosed by RT-PCR. Mm. So they, um, they must be having some level of virus. I don't know what the range of virus is, and I don't know what the peak day that titers occur on. Um, I mean, the good news is that the virology community that is working on this are going to have all that data, mm. and they're going to have high-quality data. And... Um, so that, I think, will be extremely beneficial for the rest of the world, especially as it is published and comes out. And so, to some extent, uh, our first uh, responders on the field right now are, in, are the virology community uh, and the public health community in China. And so, we need to root for them. <laughs> yeah. This, the, the fellow in uh, Washington who uh, came back from Wuhan and, and got ill, I mean, he said he didn't go to the market. He wasn't near anybody that was sick. So that suggests to me that someone was shedding without anybody knowing it, right? That's correct. So the family cohort that I talked uh, that I mentioned earlier, none of the members in that family had gone to the uh, to the open market. Yeah. In fact, only one of them had gone to a hospital. So um, that may have been the origin of the um, the first transmission event that then led to spread yeah. to the other the other people in the family, but that's a clear a clear evidence of a family cohort, and that's the second one that I've heard of, which again supports the idea that the virus has this virus is moving into more of a community based um, spread uh, mode of action mm -hmm. uh, again, mm -hmm. which is, which is a higher level of concern, and and I think um, one thing that I think the listeners of the program need to be aware of and the public in general here in the United States is if you were looking for another signpost of that, that should be, um, that should elevate your level of concern would be if there was local spread occurring from travelers who have now got, have been uh, found uh, that have, that have uh, traveled to different countries mm -hmm. and then initiated new uh, cycles of, of disease in those countries. And that would be a, a real, me um, real barometer of concern for this country and elsewhere. So far we have a number of other countries, but with just a few cases, one or a few, right? That's correct. So there haven't been any new outbreaks, but we'll see. None but, that have been reported yet, yeah. which is which is good news. And to some extent, you know, uh, 
a country is always concerned if they get a case or two. The, the truth of the matter is that a couple of cases that don't spread to other individuals in your country is a good thing because they can potentially provide virus, which is needed for developing therapeutics and vaccines and drugs. They can provide uh, cells and other samples which can be used to actually build immune therapeutics to rapidly treat infections. So um, as long as these individuals don't spread to other people, this could be a very good thing for the overall uh, health of, of our population and elsewhere. And, and you said that there's not really any good evidence about the incubation period, right, so far? Uh, the, uh, I have this recollection that it's about five days, five okay. to six days, yes, before uh, you begin to see symptomatic disease. Uh, again, that was from a quick read, so I could, mm. I could easily be off by a day or two. Okay. Could we go back to the Huanan fish market? Tell us, sure. your, tell us your thoughts about it. I'd rather not. <laughs> oh, I, I kind of enjoyed but it my first time. It. Yeah, we can certainly discuss <laughs> it, yes. We can discuss it, but not go there. Tell us uh, your thoughts about what seems to have happened there. So to explain the importance of the fish market, I think I need to talk a little bit about the group 2B coronaviruses. Mm -hmm. So SARS is a group 2B coronavirus. It's a bat coronavirus. When it emerged in 2003, we didn't know it was a bat coronavirus. <clears throat> but what we did discover quickly was that this virus infected civets and raccoon dogs in the open market. And so the hypothesis was is that it that uh, as it was adapting and, and replicating in civets and raccoon dogs, um, beneficial mutations occurred so that the virus could spread into human hosts. And uh, some strains then had evolved changes that would allow the virus to cycle back and forth between civets, raccoon dogs, and humans. And civet and raccoon dogs were a, a delicacy, especially in southern China. And so they were maintained in the open market, providing a... Um, a ready source of virus to initiate and maintain an epidemic or, or, or sorry, an outbreak um, uh, in various Chinese cities. It was later shown that uh, SARS was actually a bat virus. Um, um, investigators in the Institute of Virology at Wuhan identified uh, SARS-like bat coronavirus strains that are 1, 5, 10% different than SARS. And we and they have both shown that many of these bat coronaviruses, SARS-like coronaviruses, are, have the intrinsic capacity to infect human cells, lung cells that are targeted by SARS and actually grow in those cells as well as SARS coronavirus. So in, essence, in other words, there's a reservoir of SARS-like viruses in bats that can spill over into uh, human hosts at any given time and initiate infection. <clears throat> now, whether they could transmit isn't from person to person is another issue. But there's this intrinsic capacity for the group 2B coronaviruses to traffic between species. Now, we have a grant uh, with EcoHealth, Peter Dajak in, in, in EcoHealth, and uh, Zhengli Shi at the Institute of Virology in Wuhan. Uh, the main goal of that grant was to try to find the other bookend of SARS-like coronaviruses that um, – uh, can, can initiate infection of human cells and use human entry components, cell, uh, human receptors to get into cells. And so we had hypothesized that there were SARS-like viruses out there that were 20, 25, 30 percent different, but could still use the human receptors to get in. And that, so that was the goal of the grant. And we were running around looking in caves and isolating viruses from bats. Well, so the 2009 novel coronavirus is about 22% different than SARS. And so when you think about SARS-like coronaviruses, think about them as a, a, um, a, a Encyclopedia Britannica, where SARS is the A volume. And then as you go, you know, 2%, 5%, 10% different, you've got the B, C, D volume. And eventually you get to novel coronavirus 2019 from Wuhan, which is the Z volume. And so these two viruses basically are bookending a huge pool of zoonotic viruses that uh, could spill into human populations and cause outbreaks. So SARS used civet and raccoon dogs. So the question now becomes, um, did this Wuhan virus um, uh, cycle through some, um, some um, animal that might have been maintained in the open markets 
the fish markets in Wuhan. And it was it's much more than a fish market, by the way. They sell um, a variety of meat products. Apparently, it was illegal, but um, they sold uh, uh, rat meat. Uh, 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 there were also pla- apparently places you could get civet and raccoon dog meat and uh, snakes and other and other reptiles, and that would be uh, uh, sold in the open market. So, um, one immediate hypothesis based on the SARS and the MERS coronavirus paradigms would be that this new virus um, went from bats either directly into humans or bats into some intermediate host in the open market and then spilled over into humans, uh, both of which are likely. Uh, the authorities say they do not sell bat meat in mm. these open markets, but Wuhan has 11 million people and there's a lot of open markets. So I, I, you know, I'm not in a position to say one way or the other. Well, and, and live animal, live animal, um, grocery shopping is a, is a fixture of Chinese cuisine and, and markets. I, I was there a number of years ago and went into Walmart to get something and at Walmart in China is a surreal experience. But, um, one of the, <laughs> one of the odd aspects of it is the food section, you know, cases of live turtles and yeah, things, things correct. like that, because that's, Turtle that's how problem. you sell food in China. They want it fresh. They want it live. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, that's not, that's not different or worse than say, um, you know, us eating raw oysters, which I find alarming as well. Um, so this is this is just this is part of how things are done there. That's correct. <clears throat> so um, go ahead, go ahead. I, so I want to just clarify the the SARS. Did the did the virus actually replicate in raccoon dogs and civets, or was it just contaminated in the field? Do we it was know? Better. It was much better studied in civets, and it definitely replicated in civets. And the civets were brought in from remote locations, so they, they were presumably affected there on a farm or in the wild, That's correct. right? There were, I, I don't remember the number of civet farms um, that supplied the uh, larger cities, but it was a large number of, it was a very large operation. Yeah. I think civets are, are also farmed today in a variety of places, Um if they're fed coffee beans, that becomes a uh, a delicacy. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I presume the vir- your virology friends there are, s- are sifting through all these carcasses and trying to find virus, right? I'm sure of it. <laughs> so, uh, Ralph, the the in the case of SARS, uh, it, just to you know uh, make sure of this, uh, is it correct that that could be? Uh, the outbreak could be traced ultimately to one of these uh, live markets? It's certainly possible, or it could be traced to bats. Um, okay. Um, and, the, uh, there are people from uh, um, rural areas that come into the live markets to sell their their um, product. Uh, if if any of those, those farmers or uh, live near caves that have bats, they, they could actually have been infected. Uh, by SARS-like viruses directly. In fact, if you do serolo- serologic studies in and around these big bat caves that harbor large pandemic populations, um, you find uh, people who work in and around those caves are oftentimes seropositive against these SARS-like coronaviruses. That's so it could be, could be that way. It could be an infected animal in the open market. Uh, or it, it, uh, so both are possible. Both right. and, so and the, the fish market could be a red herring. Um, it's it's unlikely it's a fish. Yeah. <laughs> About a snake, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think paper. it. I, I I understand. I under, I'm well aware of that paper. Yeah. Um, I think it's unlikely that it's a snake. Uh, when you look at the sequence, it's 96 percent identical to bat strains. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was some computational gymnastics that were done to look at um, uh, patterns of uh, nucleotide uh, uh, organization that suggested that it was more similar to things in snakes than other things. But whether that's any kind of strong signature for uh, emergence of a snake, I think, is a, a pretty large intuitive leap. There are there are snake coronaviruses, right? There are. And are they are they in the same? Uh 
um, grouping as the bat coronas. So my re- recollection is they're much they're a little bit smaller. Yeah. Um, I know that there's a boa coronavirus. Uh, somebody and it's been sequenced. Uh, someone was interested, tried to get me to make a molecular clone of it, but <laughs> I. <laughs> I didn't have time, and so I didn't do it. And now, unfortunately, you asked me the question, and I can't remember enough about the genome organization to give you an intelligent answer. Yeah, because I noticed on the phylogenetic tree that uh, EcoHealth published, there's no snake corona sequence on there. Right. They didn't. They're they're claiming that this might be a snake coronavirus, and then they don't put the snake coronaviruses on the tree, which is odd. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they're In quite per- it, they're, they are very different than yeah. the group 2B coronaviruses. So as far as I know, there has never been a group 2B coronavirus isolated from a snake. Going back to the market question, in uh, in this particular case with this uh, outbreak, um, is there a good epidemiological or other uh, evidence to actually trace this outbreak to a market? Well, I think the contact tracing, uh, so so the initial set of patients that began to show up in hospital in Wuhan, there was a common thread that several of them worked in and around the open markets. Okay. Um, okay. As you might expect, because of the SARS epidemic of 2000, um, outbreak of 2003, uh, it would be a logical question for uh, Chinese physicians to um, to ask as they collected information about a um, a novel of a case of viral pneumonia. So, do you think it's possible that it will all boil down to one event, one patient zero, or event zero, or that we'll know ever? <laughs> uh, that's a good. That's a good question. So far, there. Uh, I don't know where we are in terms of the number of genomes that have been sequenced. Um, my recollection is that the um, the first five that came out, uh, one of them had a fair amount of sequence variation in the spike glycoprotein that suggested it might be a novel introduction. Um, when they uh, reevaluated that draft sequence, a lot of that variation disappeared. And so most of the sequences from the first 10 that, that I recall anal- looking at, uh, they were nearly identical, which would suggest common source. Um, as more sequences become available, we may find a second lineage. And I, I recall one report on the internet, so I don't know how true it is, that they're saying that there's two lin- there's two clades or two lineages that seem to be circulating. Uh, I don't know if that's from ground zero, from where they started, or whether um, variants have emerged after X number of person-to-person transmissions that indicate you know, a, a new uh, variant that uh, is is developing some level of success in terms of its transmission. So if you look at the latest WHO sit rep, there's a paragraph from Andrew Rambo who says we have 23 full genome sequences, little genetic variation. Okay. No evidence of additional introductions. So, so, so I think that's, that's certainly good news. So another question that comes up is is uh, why corona, and also is there now um, an ascertainment bias or a detection bias? Why corona? Isn't it my corona? <laughs> what? Right, <laughs> Sorona. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds like a question we need to have a couple of beers on. Right? <laughs> yes, right. exactly. With or without a lime. <laughs> Dixon, hello, Dixon. I'm back. I, I, I'm I back. hear it's secure. Um, <laughs> One thing that seems to be fairly, um, not unique, but certainly privileged among coronaviruses is, is that they seem to replicate better and transmit, perhaps perhaps cause more severe disease in the elderly. And uh, currently, I think uh, the population, the global population of individuals above 60 is approaching 1 billion. It's 800 million, I think, or seven seven 800 million. So there's a lot more. Uh, individuals who are uh, aged, and uh, even the common contemporary coronaviruses have a tendency to cause um, more severe disease and replicate more efficiently in uh, people in retirement communities or or who are over um, 60, 65 years of age. So that's one factor. A second factor is that coronaviruses may not, um, especially emerging coronaviruses, may not transmit as efficiently 
as some other respiratory viruses. And so they are dependent on population size and population density. So as popula- especially as population density goes up, uh, a new emerging coronavirus may be now at a theoretical uh, improved ad- uh, uh, advantage of being able to undergo the first eight or ten transmission cycles that are needed to gain the beneficial mutations to colonize the human host or the new or the new animal host. So that's another potential hypothesis. I had a third one, but I think I kind of forgot it in the middle. <laughs> what was the other? Um, if there's an ascertainment bias or detection bias now that we have assays or well another thing may be that um you know, if you think about these outbreaks that are the first 40 cases or so, um, 30% of the cases have severe disease, a higher percentage with SARS, higher percentage with MERS, fair, fairly high mortality rate, 10 to 38% mortality rate. In a more rural, rural setting, that may have a tendency to um, kill all the members of a family mm-hmm. or cause the death of a village. And then the disease would burn out. But as uh, communities, um, large-scale communities, become up, in, come in contact with more and more uh, wildlife, and begin to diminish the habitat for wildlife, uh, there's increased chance of transmission of viruses into people. Now, um, if you might imagine that as the human population expands, if if bat populations become more condensed in panictic, you know, 10 million bat colonies made up of 15 to 30 different bat species. Generalists, um, uh, bat coronaviruses that are generalists could potentially infect many different bat species and be an advantage. These coronavirus receptors like ACE2 and dipeptidyl peptidase 4 are pretty conserved across mammals. And so generalists, um, by happenstance, may have intrinsic properties to spill over into humans. So it might be a combination of expanding human population, aging of the population, density of the population, and, and coupled with um, the um, animal, wildlife bat populations being um, becoming more and more confined, confined in um, a smaller habitat so that generalists are being selected and so that could lead them to spill over. Uh, by the way, that was completely speculative. I'll just throw <laughs> okay. okay. But I, did it sound good? Yeah, Wonderful. yeah, yeah good. it sounded yeah. great. Yes, I good. really like that. It made me want to go into a cave and catch some bats and look for viruses. Oh, fine. <laughs> you mentioned ACE2, so there are a couple of papers, including one where, where a wet experiment was done, which are saying that uh, this part of the spike at least can bind ACE2. What do you think of that, and what does it mean, Ralph? Well, um, I think I think the data uh, in the one paper that was published, published in Biorix uh, is pretty good. It demonstrates that the virus can grow in virus cells, and it can uh, infect cells that uh, have been transfected with the human ACE2 receptor, but not the mouse ACE2 receptor, for example. So that's pretty good data to suggest that uh, it's part of this uh, SARS coronavirus Encyclopedia Britannica that um, is uh, has all those uh, related features to SARS. Uh, they use the same human receptor. They can use bat and human receptors. Uh, they can grow in in primary human cells. They produce a, disease, a similar disease called acute respiratory distress syndrome. They uh, cause higher mortality in the age population. And so all of those features are arguing that uh, at least the entry mechanism, the entry machinery is the same. And hence, the tropism machinery and the disease outcome in the lung may be very similar. Mm -hmm. Um, What's novel, I think, about the receptor binding domain of the new virus is that it is quite different than SARS. And so you can't immediately predict whether civets or raccoon dogs might be the intermediate species. Mm. Uh, because of that variation, it could be some other mammal, easily could be another mammal. Ralph, in the, pres- in the case of uh, SARS, we had the phenomenon of super spreaders, individuals who infected a large number of other individuals. Is there any evidence of that uh, so far in this case? There was uh, one report um, 
again, out of the news media of uh, 12 to 14 healthcare workers that were infected from a single infected individual, that would be considered a super spreader event. Alternatively, since we really don't know what the RO of this um, virus is, um, you, you know, I think it's it's too early to say super spreader event. I, you could call SARS cases, you could you could call select uh, transmission clusters super spreader events mm -hmm. because the average transmission in a in a SARS infected individual was to something like one and a half to two and a half people. So, in other words, one infected case could some, could transmit up to, up to about two people. Uh, in that sort of scenario, somebody that infects 19 is considered a super spreader. So, what, right. was, the, what was the incubation period for that particular outbreak? Uh, I don't know. And that has not been published yet. So, uh, until I see it in the print, uh, you know, I don't really know. Yeah. The, if you're… Um, if if listeners of the program are really interested in the state of the art knowledge of transmission for um, uh, for the 2019 virus, the, the Lancet paper came out today, and you can download that paper and take a look at it. I haven't had a chance to read it in its entirety. The uh, at yesterday's WHO meeting, they they had a preliminary R naught of 1.4 to 2.5, so in line with what you were saying for SARS, right? Right. In which case, that, that hospital cluster that I just talked about would be considered a super spreader event. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the reason I'm hesitant to say that is because the, uh, the example in the uh, Lancet article is that one individual may have spread to six individuals in the family setting, mm -hmm. which would argue that ROs could potentially be a lot higher than one and a half to two and a half. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> right. Sure. I, I wanted to ask you about… Um, uh, antivirals. Now, you recently published a paper looking at antivirals for MERS coronavirus. So give us your thoughts on whether any of the existing ones might be effective, whether they will be tested and so forth. Uh, there have been several papers of different combination, uh, different therapies that have been tested in MERS patients that have not worked. Mm -hmm. um, unless I had them in front of me, I couldn't recite them off the top of my head. The current gold standard therapy that's being tested in um, the Middle East is a lapinavir, ritinavir, interferon, alpha, or beta combination, combinatorial therapy. And so in a paper that we just published in Nature Communications, we compared um, remdesivir to uh, that combination therapy in uh, MERS coronavirus mouse models of human disease. And in this case, I want to you know, be clear that in our mouse models of human disease, they develop acute respiratory distress syndrome. So this is a model that somewhat approximates what's seen in human cases. Uh, in the case of MERS, uh, we've been we've been able to show that remdesivir is much more um, um, protective, both prophylactically and therapeutically, from weight loss, um, uh, tighter. It causes, I'm sorry, causes, causes uh, treatment with remdesivir is associated with less weight loss, reduced virus titers, improved respiratory function, and a reduced ARDS pathology uh, as compared to ritinavir, uh, the, the triple combination therapy I mentioned earlier. Uh, we, we had published in a paper previously that that same, that remdesivir also was very effective against SARS coronavirus. But not only was it effective in vivo and in vitro, but in vitro it also was affected, effective against a suite of group 2B coronaviruses that are SARS-like that range from about 5% different than SARS to 30% different than SARS. And the uh, strain that was 30% different from SARS um, is very similar to the uh, 2019 uh, isolate that emerged, so we would expect remdesivir would be effective against that as well. Now, uh, there's, um, there is a caveat uh, in, that, in, in both of those papers. Uh, in our models, both SARS and the MERS models, um, the, under therapeutic conditions, the drugs really only work for about a little bit less than two days prior, after infection. Mm -hmm. And the reason that is, is that uh, the animals develop acute respiratory distress syndrome by day three. In humans, it's around day eight. Mm -hmm. 
uh, following MERS coronavirus infection. So we have a compressed disease window as compared to what's seen in human patients. Um, but the bottom line, our data suggests that the quicker you get drug to patients, the more likely it would be uh, uh, beneficial to their overall health status. Mm -hmm. um, Gilead, I know, has been in contact <clears throat> with uh, the U.S. government, the WHO, and, and uh, authorities in China. Um, I know that there were, there, you know, remdesivir was tested against Ebola. It was uh, partially effective, but not anywhere near as effective as a therapeutic human antibody. Um, so it's not recommended for Ebola patients. Um, uh, but in our hands, it works against every single human coronavirus. We have another paper that's about to be submitted that identifies another nucleoside analog that is also equally effective against all coronaviruses that we've tested. So we would imagine that it would also be effective against uh, against this new virus. The, the advantage of the new drug is it's a pill form, so it could be taken orally as compared to remdesivir, which would have to be given IV. I suppose somewhere in China, someone has a virus isolate, right? Yes. Uh, the, uh, Dr. Shi at the Institute of Virology in her BioRix paper has isolated virus. As far as I can tell, that's the only virus that's been isolated to date. Okay. That's going to be hard to ship to anybody at this point. That's correct. I, I know that, I mean, our lab is interested in making a, uh, synthetically resurrecting the virus using reverse genetics. So we're working on that. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be a few more weeks. You have to get right. permission to do it with a new virus. Is that right? I told the NIH and the CDC that I was doing it and I would provide them with virus and, and, and others. All right. We got you for an hour. Anything else anyone has? That's what I promised to keep them for an hour. Did you mention my nephew? No, I didn't mention. Why would I mention your nephew? I don't know because I'm on the show. Tell, mention so my nephew. nephew just got back from Wuhan. He was there as, as a musician for eight days, and he played concerts, and he played to over 2,000 people at one of his concerts, and he ate out every night, and he was shown the town, basically, and he was well aware of the fact that this thing was ongoing. And, you know, there are 11 million people that live there, so he figured he wouldn't be one of the ones that got easy. Young guy, he's in good shape, but uh, he's also concerned, and I told him I'd keep him informed, so... We'll see. And that's why I asked you about the incubation period because uh, – Did he just come back? He just came back about – and he missed not coming back by one day. If he had yeah. decided the day after that, right. he would have been grounded. Well, look, tell him <clears throat> he feels badly to go get – Yeah, no, no, no. He yeah. knows. He knows. He yeah. knows. <laughs> um, I, I'm probably going to need to take – to get, jump off because I have to participate in a WHO call. You bet. Oh, dear. Uh, yep. Yep. But uh, I, thanks for interviewing me. I hope it hope it turns out well and I – Thank you, Ralph. And hopefully, it sound like uh, an idiot. hopefully we'll get you back in <laughs> uh, great. in the near future and talk about it some more. I'm the resident well, that, idiot, by the way, Ralph. All right, Don't thank worry. you, Ralph. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks a lot, Ralph. Ralph. <laughs> so, bye bye. Where is he located? I'm sorry, I missed that. North Carolina. Okay, great. UNC. Carolina. Oh, good, good, good. Ralph, he's uh, his fourth time on, dude. Yeah, well, maybe I missed the other three. Well, too. you never <laughs> listen. That's the thing, dude. <laughs> you never listen. I think we covered most of what we wanted to talk about. Yeah, yeah there so. are a bunch of, bunch of groups working on it, um, people working on vaccines, which, of course, will take years. Um, so that's that, the we, vaccines the, we didn't mention, but if you there's a SIDRAP article where they talk yes. about Fauci at mm -hmm. NIH, Hotez. Peter Hotez, yeah. Seppi. They're all saying we're going to do vaccines and we'll do a phase one later this year. I'm just curious what – How? <laughs> what are they going to do? Because no one has – I get, there's a MERS camel vaccine, right? Right, which has been somewhat uh, working in, in camels, but are they going to just do that? Because it's not like you just say, "Yeah, we know how to make a vaccine; we're just going to do it." So I don't know what they're going to do. Do you know yeah, what the know. what's the format of that vaccine? Is it live attenuated? Is it a subunit, a subunit? vaccine? Kill? That's a good what? question. We did talk about it here, so let's uh, do a quick search for MERS vaccine TWIV. Uh, let's see, camel runny noses and other junk. Here we go. That's it. TWIV three six nine. <laughs> testing of a MERS coronavirus vaccine for camels. It's a science article. And uh, this vaccine is a modified vaccinia Ankara with oh. the MERS spike glycoprotein. Okay. So it's a recombinant, dude. It's a recombinant it's a, fox it's a, virus. It's cool. A huh. fox virus vector expressing the uh, antigenic, the uh, um, Presumably the most antigenic component of the virus, surface right. protein. 
So I, maybe that would be one thing. Let's take this new 2019 sure. virus spike, put it in there. But everyone's going to have their own approach. So that'll be curious to see. Mm-hmm. This uh, I've been uh, looking at this uh, Lancet paper while you guys have been talking. It's mm-hmm. uh, very nice. Okay. You know, the, 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 one of the bottom lines for me is that it's early. Yes, it's early. Whole thing. Sure, it's very and there's early. a lot that we don't know. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. And the, you know, the big question is I'm, you know, I'm kind of looking in my own mind for some sort of graph of the time course of accumulation of cases, which I'm, I haven't seen any of those, but I'm sure that this sort of data will become available in uh, situation uh, reports. But it would be interesting to have that compared with SARS, not that the comparison is all that informative. Uh, you, don't, you don't get any data with SARS. That was the problem, right? Yeah. And in fact, one of the things somebody put a link to Kathy, here, I yeah. think it might have been Kathy, the yeah. South China Morning Post has yeah. a brilliant series of graphics and, and one of them yeah. one of them shows Chinese authorities reactions comparing <laughs> SARS which took it was it was 86 days between the the outbreak and the time they notified the rest of the world and they were discouraging reporting on it in the meantime and this one it's 23 days from the initial patient showing up with pneumonia like symptoms to the the announcement mhm this so travel definite, ban, definite improvement. The the travel ban is really dramatic. The, the, yes, there's not there's never been anything done like that before, right? No, uh, there have well, been things that done level. like <laughs> that, and that's where you get the data showing that this is a really bad idea. <laughs> well, because when you when you when the authorities come and say, "Okay, we're not letting anybody in or out of this city." Everybody heads for the exit. They want to leave now, and that's you right. can't stop them. That's right. You know, there's no way. That you can, even in China, which has a robust surveillance state in place, there is just the sheer volume of people that they would be dealing with. They can't stop them. Yeah. There, there are going to be people coming out of this area. And now that you've shut down all the official channels, you right. can't keep track of them. Right. One thing uh, they, so you, they, they are doing, worse. one thing they are doing that's useful is thermal scans at airports yes. and train stations, right? So that people, kind of thing, I think, is a great idea. So it's people with temperatures. So far, it hasn't worked, however. <laughs> well, no, that's, you know, they're they're pulling people they're pulling people aside and making everybody aware that if you feel sick coming yeah. from these destinations, yeah. then you need to go to the hospital, and that's how, um, you know, that's how we are getting these early reports and early detections in other countries. Sure. As people travel with this and show up, um, and in the U.S., we now have two confirmed cases and a bunch of suspected ones, um, one confirmed in Washington State, one confirmed in um, Chicago. There's a suspected case in Texas, and then some other, a whole bunch of other people are being tested. I think there are a lot of suspected cases in Texas. Right? Yes. That's something else. Um, yes, but suspected cases of this virus. So the... the this thermal scan is a good idea. I really like that. That was useful uh, during the SARS outbreak. But, of course, if you're infected early on, you don't yet have a fever, you will go somewhere right. and incubate. So it doesn't get every single infection. That's important to know that. This um, South China Morning Post article, Kathy, have mm-hmm. a list of all the animals that they sell at the meat market. Oh, I yes. know. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. There's some scorpion. things. A scorpion. <laughs> And things I don't I, even I saw know. Those, I saw those for sale in a, in a market in, um, I guess it was in Guangzhou or Fuchan. Um, mm. And we, we went to the market one day and, and sure enough, you know, you can buy, there's somebody there with a huge container of live scorpions for sale. And, and I'm told they're very tasty deep fried. Mm-hmm. We couldn't find any that were prepared and we did, couldn't do them in our hotel room. Thailand has lots of those. Sounded interesting. Yeah. Porcupines, cicadas. What is this yeah. uh, scolopendra? Scolopendra. Oh, I would not eat that. I hope, that's looks not like a, a, <laughs> hope it's not a pangolin. <laughs> it's a long, it's, it looks like a centipede. Centipede. Oh, yeah. I'd, eat, I'd eat that. <laughs> you would, huh? Yeah. So it's you ought really to put cool. the link put the link to that thing in the show notes. And also I think I have found historically that these World Health Organization situation reports uh are really are really yeah, helpful. Good. So let's yes. put that link in. Put that in. There are two of those so far. This South China, <clears throat> they have a picture of people preparing food and you know let's just say that there are ample opportunities for tra- transmission. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, these yeah. dudes and ladies preparing the food, they could easily infect themselves. No question. And then they can all go home. And I thought, and I think we mentioned this, that some of the earliest cases were all people that were associated with the market, right? Uh, yeah, the Lancet, said, paper, market, uh, right? the Lancet paper. The Lancet paper looks at, uh, it's, yeah. you know, is a fairly early snapshot of this. Okay. So it's yeah, yeah. By, two, by January 2nd. So it's three weeks ago, 41 admitted hospital cases. <laughs> and uh, uh, 27 or 66% of those had been exposed to the uh, sea, uh, seafood market. Mm. Okay. Yeah, but so the, there's the, actually two Lancet papers, and I posted both links in. It's hard to know whether they're open access, but I was able to get them. Oh. In the hospital, though, you should have an absolutely spot-on incubation period timing because you know when the patient was admitted, you know which room they were in, you know who went into Why the room. Why would you admit them if they don't have symptoms yet? No, but they, no, no, they were hospital workers, no, they said. The hospital employees, no, no, hospital you said. employees, okay. Right. Then you'd know it. Their well, it contact the time, paper. it should be. Could the, be in the paper. No, no, maybe they're not saying. This, yeah, I mean, well, I'm expecting that the, information out pretty soon. Yeah, that information came out probably after these papers went to press. A lot of this could be addressed or mitigated with you know more robust food safety regulations even if you're going to have a live market oh, here's no. what you have to do oh yeah uh, i know i was thinking about that but you know what this is a cultural tradition it's not gonna happen you can't change what, it. no no well as i said we have a lot of cultural traditions that are that are horrifying from a microbiological perspective but if you handle the food correctly then it's not such a problem um I, you know, yeah. so we we manage to control this, and we do have food safety problems in our in our system, and and in Europe and in other countries. Um, but the point of the the food safety regulations is to mitigate that, and and it seems like there's room to yeah, maybe. go into these. You know, making the live markets illegal is definitely not the right approach because they're going to happen anyway. That's right. Um, right. But uh, in my uh, as Ralph said, there's probably illegal meat being sold yeah which is sure. not supposed to be sure. sold so and so you know getting getting that uh you know better better run and making sure that people have the 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 um uh that the sales people in the market have the ability to that work safely, to yeah. understand infection control and work safely because for their own safety it seems unfortunate though that this ends up spreading globally right it does, that this but is, that's uh, the world we live in. You it know, is. It is. Yes, we're I all mean, connected, and you could be anywhere in twenty four hours. I mean, I was, you know, if you catch bush meat in Africa, you you can get Ebola. Although there, it's not but a delicacy. Bush meat, by the way, that's what we call game when white people are hunting it. It's, uh, <laughs> it's the, there. It's not a delicacy. It's their food. Right. Sure. So it's a different thing, and you can't really say don't do this because they don't have a supermarket to go to. And and I'm from a family where people hunt deer. You know, so that's bush meat, um, and they may and get the uh, prion diseases one day. And they could know. be, they <laughs> could potentially get. You know, we don't know. Um, I've actually had relatives ask me about that. So, what about this chronic wasting disease? Well, yeah, right. The good article in Sidrap today. They just found it in more Minnesota deer. Really? Apparently, yeah. Wow, it's spreading more and more. Um, so, one one last thing I wanted to uh, talk about. This is our, our paper, but we can we can do it in a relatively quick manner. So there's this idea, and, and Ralph mentioned this. You know, the, these viruses jump from animal hosts, reservoirs, into people, and then in people they further mutate, of course, as they move through, as they replicate. And then there's some idea that, in which Ralph suggested that you select for viruses that are particularly good at spreading through the population, right? Although we for all the viruses we've studied, we don't know any of that. We don't have any. We can't identify such mutations because you don't have the starting. Virus. Exactly, exactly. And I was talking to Ralph Dennison, not Ralph, <clears throat> Mark. Mark Dennison yesterday. And he said this virus could have been out there for a thousand years, and it just happened yeah. to jump into people now. It didn't have to change, and it's it's spreading pretty well. So I don't know. Yeah, that that was sort of what I was trying to ask with my ascertainment bias thing. Is it? You know, just something that, you know, like how many events do we think happened for HIV and how long ago was that yeah, until yeah. we saw it? Right. Anyway, so this reminded me of a paper published two years ago, um, which is in Nature 
what is the fast one here? Uh, scientific reports, right? Scientific reports. Mm -hmm. Attenuation of replication by a 29 nucleotide deletion in SARS coronavirus acquired during the early stages of human to human transmission. And this is from a, a large group uh, in uh, Germany. And uh, the last author is Christian Drosten, and first author is Doreen Muth. So, should we just do this? paper now as a more or less snippet and yeah, we have yeah, a couple yeah. other things yeah, we'll, show that we yeah. we'll snippetize we'll, we'll snippetize this here because i think it it's relevant um, yes very this was a mutation a deletion in a small open reading frame in the viral genome encoding a small protein and it was detected relatively early in the sars transmission and people thought that this was one of these mutations that makes the virus transmit better in people right and some data were accumulated in cell culture over the years that kind of supported that idea. But here in this paper, what they did was construct viruses with uh, the deletion, which is a, introduces a frame shift so you don't get the protein. Then they completely deleted the protein, the, the gene, the, the sequence encoding the protein. And then they put this virus into cultured cells. And they put them in a variety of cells they put them in bat cells, which they have introduced the uh, viral receptor. Remember, this is SARS coronavirus now. Mm. And, and this they, is a this is a gene that we really don't know what it does. Don't right. know what it. Does. It could be it could be called an accessory gene because you can get some replication in the absence of this. Yeah. They put it in bat cells. They put it in human airway epithelial cells. They put it in cells which they say shouldn't be uh, involved in the transmission chain: cotton rats, goats, sheep. And in all cells, the deletion reduces viral replication. Okay, I—I I mean, in some cell, the, the most convincing are in the resp human respiratory epithelial cells, where the where the effects are quite substantial. They say up to twenty fold or so. And so, that the, first, the interesting thing is, why would a deleterious mutation even persist? This this deletion went through the rest of the epidemic. And they can also find this in bats, I think in Europe, European bats, but not in Asian bats. And so that, that's really an interesting problem because we always think of, well, if you change a genome to debilitate the virus, it's going to get kicked out because it'll be... I have a repeated. little bit of a terminology yes. issue here. So <clears> this <throat> idea that it's attenuated, that this is debilitating, that it's hurting the virus in cell culture... Yeah, okay. That's all we have right and, now. Yeah. And and that is no, I'm not I'm not saying that this shouldn't have been done or that it's a bad study. It's it's you know, looks to be fairly solid work and they, they certainly did a lot of work. Um but we need to bear in mind that the what the virus does to spread from host to host is a certain set of requirements and what the virus does to multiply to a high titer in cell culture is a different set of requirements. No, of course. So it's atten course. it's attenuated in cell culture. It may replicate to lower levels in vivo, even, but maybe there's some advantage to replicating to lower levels. Maybe well, you get to more cells that way. That that's the key. So I, I mean, this is a framework for discussing this concept. Right. I agree. Yeah. It, it's all in cells, and they say that their mouse models don't actually uh, reproduce SARS. Although Ralph apparently does. Remember, he said right. that his mice develop acute respiratory distress. But I think it's quite interesting that this reduces replication. And we don't know what it does in people. What we know is that it was there. And they, they argue that, well, there must not have been competition. So this virus was not outcompeted because this had just <coughs> spilled over from bats. And that was the only coronavirus in, in this population and so forth. But whatever the reason is, it sustained throughout the epidemic. And their hypothesis is that mutations sustained during virus spread don't necessarily have to make the virus more transmissible or more virulent, which is what, if you looked at the press in the past week, right, the yeah. Chinese min vice minister yes. said, oh, the virus could mutate and become more transmissible yeah. or virulent. I mean, that's the default thought that, and um, if you look at some of these papers, it's the same idea. Yeah, but here they showed that it's actually reduced, although to Alan's point, we don't know what it does in people. It's true. But I but I agree wholeheartedly with the their overall conclusion that, you know, because it just because it mutated and that's the strain that you see throughout the epidemic does not mean that that made it more fill in the blank. Exactly. Uh, 
you know it uh, it so it's re- uh, as replicating at lower levels maybe that makes it more or less virulent maybe it doesn't um whatever the case it it had this deletion and SARS was able to replicate in humans um but we should not conclude that this deletion is you know making it making it more of something so so every time there's an outbreak this comes up of course uh, <laughs> it, usually in the press okay and they say we're afraid that this thing is going to mutate and become more Kill us all. as alan says yes. that's right has there ever been an example no. where that's borne out no no, no, no you, this is so this is what i'm gonna ask you don't have the starting virus that's the problem that's true but but <laughs> right. you have the starting virus for the cell culture work so did the death rate did the cell death rate without the deletion uh, exceed that with the deletion? And if the answer is yes, then the purpose of this virus is to keep its host cells alive for as long as it can. Yeah, I don't think they report on C- No, I want to know what that, that, know what that yeah. is. I want to know what that but is. But they actually propose that maybe, you know, the selection of less virulent viruses is to allow the host to survive longer. Exactly. And that would help yeah. transmission, exactly. right? <laughs> Become a milder, <laughs> which, is, gentler... which is a long-standing <laughs> evolutionary concept it that, is, it uh, is. that right. many pathogens right. will tend to become less virulent, and some of the most successful the viruses passage. we know of yeah. cause little or no disease. Isn't that how you invented yellow fever vaccine? Damn right it is. So the last point I want to make: <laughs> they cite two instances in the discussion here of similar cases. First, MERS coronavirus. There was a deletion sustained uh, at some point in that ongoing epidemic, which they say looks like it attenuates uh, replication. And I will recall to everyone, because we covered this story multiple times, this is amino acid change that arose during the West African Ebola virus outbreak, uh, which many people thought conferred high transmissibility to the virus because it was found early on in the outbreak and it persisted throughout. And so we covered that story, and then we covered the paper where they put that virus into monkeys, a non-human primate model, and actually found that the mutation made it less virulent. <laughs> right. And so they say, these are two examples. Right. Now we have three right. where maybe the mutations are attenuating. And of course, in, in two out of three cases here, we don't know because they, they're not in animals, but Maybe that's what happens. To, as, as Alan said, this is an old standing theory in, in uh, evolution of virulence. Sure. You get less virulent. So, look, <laughs> right. how long has the attenuated yellow fever vaccine been in existence? 1950s? Correct? Has it ever become more virulent? Hell no. no. Well, the, the, of course not. But the polio vaccines do. So, it's the, they replicate in your intestine and they, be, they revert to virulence. They revert. They don't right. mutate by reverting, though, do they? They recombine. Yeah, they mutate. They I thought mutate. they recombined. Well, it's both. They, they mutate and recombine, but they reacquire what Albert Sabin took away. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay. You should have taken but more away. <laughs> has a, have we ever been able to document a increased virulence of viruses newly introduced as they travel through human populations? No. So I don't understand the worry, but it's, you know, in news, the, the doomsday uh, scenarios course, are more appealing, right? They've seen all the movies. <laughs> yes. Come on. They've seen every movie. They've read all the books. As I said yesterday, normal is not news. Correct. So. Or good um, news is not news. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I, I had my volume turned off, but I I'm was sorry. trying to. That's right. I was trying to say that I think the yellow fever vaccine uh, was like 1937. Uh, CDC says more than 80 years. Okay, yeah, more 30, than 80 years. Max Tyler hasn't did changed. That, yeah. It hasn't changed. He got. The, he did that at Rockefeller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I got it. Yeah. So I just uh, I thought this was a cool. I just read it yesterday again, and I had. Had heard Christian Drosten talk about this in in uh, the spring last year in Rotterdam, and I uh, always wanted to do this. And I think this is yeah. very relevant. Be- oh, so now the final thing is, I I emailed Drosten yesterday. I said, "Is this little Orf eight? What is it? Orf eight? Orf eight? Mm-hmm. Does yep. the twenty nineteen coronavirus have it? Yeah. And he said, "Yeah, That's it's the there. Question. It's there. And so we'll see if it's go if it goes away or." If it stays there, I don't know. And what it matters, right? Who knows? But anyway, it's interesting. So there you go. Yeah. The evolution for, of virulence. Sorry. For people who might want to have the links to it or read about it, it's in Vincent's virology blog posted January 23rd yesterday. I so. did I did write that. Yeah, I thought it would be mm-hmm. cool to write about it. I wrote it on the train to Washington. 
Mm-hmm. And it's an open access paper, so you can go read it. And my blog is also open access. So the pen Not marks shit. are all over the paper as that it is the train shakes back and forth. I can't write on that train. <laughs> I, use, I use a computer to yeah, write. Yeah, Did you know that you could do that? <laughs> No. I have to show you sometime. I'll show you sometime. Okay? <laughs> Welcome to the 18th century. <laughs> um, let me just, so I want to tell everyone what I did yesterday, just 10 minutes. What did you do yesterday? So yesterday I was invited to attend a meeting of the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. All right. The NSABB, which uh, was founded in the 2000s to help the government decide if Research was uh, dangerous. Any proposed research was had dual use. It could be used for bad as well as good. Um, and it was just a very interesting committee. So we talked a lot about this committee during the H five N one avian yes transmission because they reviewed the Fouché and Kawaoka papers and were thinking about not publishing them. Remember those were who could forget <laughs> when they adapted the virus to transmit ferrets among ferrets, right? Ferrets. They got everybody scared and the NSABB looked at it. And because of that, now there are a whole set of regulations and acronyms, which I, I tell you, so this is all government stuff and the acronyms are prolif- <laughs> prolific, prolific, Proli- a lot Prolific. of profligate? Profligate. Prolific. profligate. Prof- Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Numerous. They're non profligate. <laughs> I mean, I still can't remember what NSABB is about, but there's another. The National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. Biosecurity. And then there's another one. Oh, you're going to love this. So, dual use research is DUR, and then dual use research of concern is DERC. Mm-hmm. And then they talk about p- p- potential PPPs. What does it stand for? Pandemic pathogens. Yeah, Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Potential pandemic pathogens. Then, so the way the the, the policy works now, you have to, if you're going to do these experiments, they have to be approved at multiple levels before they even go to a study section. And uh, one of the last steps is reviewed by another committee called the P3CO committee. That sounds like Star Wars. So P3 is PPP. (laughs) And then, well, I think they named it that way. It sounds like C3PO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is composed only of federal employees anyway. It's robots. So the purpose of this meeting was to talk about transparency and security. So there, the transparency on two levels. First, in the publication of any data that arises from these papers. And secondly, transparency in the review process by which these proposals are looked at by these committees and how they decide whether they should go forward or not. Hmm. My view is the reason this meeting, uh, and in fact, the NSABB has not met for three years because nobody's doing, <laughs> only Fushé and Kaoka, as far as I can tell. Their work is <laughs> proceeding and no one else is doing this because no one wants to bother with this. Hmm. Um, the reason this meeting came up, I think, is because last year, the grants were finally released for the Fushé kawaoka experiments. And that was accompanied by a storm of protests in the media by by Mark Lipsitch and uh, Tom Inglesby and others who said the government is doing research that they don't want you to know about. This process was completely intransparent. We don't know why they decided that this work should go forward. They want to see the cost, ben- the, the risk benefit analysis. They want to see the numbers and all this. So that's why they had this meeting. So the complaints of two people. So these two people were at the meeting and I was there and some others and they wanted our perspective. <laughs> on transparency and so that was what the meeting is about and in fact at the end the committee got a charge from nih to come up with guidelines about transparency now you can imagine one person got up for 20 minutes and said what is transparency you know yeah (laughs) what is it and to whom are you talking about being transparent those are the emperor's new clothes by the way (laughs) she one guy said if you give the public twenty thousand pages of a document that's not transparency because they can't (laughs) Right. <laughs> you can't read it. And that's a good point. And it's written in Swahili. <laughs> so I, I, the good thing is there are quite a few. Well, first of all, the committee is a really good collection of smart, accomplished people. Hmm. I know a lot of them and others I met there. And they're clearly well-meaning people who want to do the right thing. And I do not think they are swayed by proclamations of doom. And in fact, one of the committee members at some point said, I'm hearing all these extremes, like a pathogen that will kill half the world. And uh, (laughs) that person said, 
this is ridiculous. Right. Can we just yeah. be a little more down to earth about what the alternatives are? And there are a lot of virologists on this committee. The, the committee is public, so you can see who they are. But I know uh, Craig Cameron, Mark Dennison, um, Mary Louise Hammer Schold. Is that how you would say it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Schold. Jim LeDuc, who was on TWIV last weekend. Well, actually, he was on in November, but he's from, he's the director of the Galveston Na- National Laboratory. Mm. Steve Morse, Gene Patterson, Roseanne Sandry Golden, uh, and a few others who were very good. There's a person who was, uh, was a director of Merck Vaccine Division, for example. Anyway, so I, I think they're going to do the right thing. But I just wanted to recount one uh, experience I had at this meeting. So I gave a summary, we made prepared statements, and I gave a summary of what I thought were the, what was done wrong with the H5N1 study. Mm-hmm. And one thing I said was that everyone ignored the fact that after aerosol transmission, adaptation to aerosol transmission in ferrets, the H5N1 virus lost its virulence. All the ferrets survived. Okay. Which for some reason did not emerge until very far into this whole thing. And mm-hmm. before that, everyone was saying this is a virus that could kill half the world, right? And I made right. I, I quoted a lot of these things. I said this is hyperbole, which has no place in a scientific discourse. And then I said that when the experiments were approved, Lipsitch and Inglesby wrote an article saying the government is allowing experiments to proceed that they don't want you to know about. And I said this is absurd. Okay, so uh, that was part of my objection. And so I just want to tell you how these two, this group of individuals reacts. My feeling is they both use not just hyperbole, but misleading statements to make their points. So uh, Lipsitch got up and he said, I want to correct two things that Dr. Racaniello just said. And he said, first, we didn't write the headline. <laughs> no, we he helped write the headline. And I wasn't allowed to respond, but I would have said, you know, the headlines are written based on what's in the article. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay? Exactly. So he seemed to be distancing himself, but not really. And then second, he said, there were only 10 ferrets in that experiment. Only 10? So I don't believe oh, it. Are you kidding? Now, the, the weird thing about that is, before we knew the ferrets didn't die, they were saying the ferret is a great model <laughs> right. for flu pathogenesis. But then once they died, there were not enough of them, which is absurd. It's right. totally absurd. 10 is not a bad number. If you do non-human primates, you... You may have one. If none of them <laughs> died. So I anyway, I think this is disingenuous and it's not really, it's because you have an agenda right? and you'll say anything to do it. So that was my experience. I was very grateful to see the people on the committee. So I think we're in good hands. However, you know, the, these individuals, they have an agenda. And I'm, I will say that neither one is a, is a wet scientist. They don't do wet experiments. Where are they located in just for... So Lipsitch is an epidemiologist at Harvard and Inglesby is in the... He's at University of Pittsburgh in a department of like biosecurity. So they think about this stuff all the time. I think the nuances of virology and infectious disease, maybe they don't understand so well. Right. Um, and that's not a... Um, I'm, it's not intended to be nasty. It's a statement of fact. And I think you need to know the nuances to understand that we're talking about very low probability Correct. events, right? We it's also even- important to realize that when somebody has taken a very public stance at an extreme end of a discussion, it is very, very hard for them to back out of that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't so, I mean, if, if Lipsitch has I mean, he's on record as having made some very inflammatory statements about the H5N1 um, stuff that didn't pan out at all. And it is very difficult for somebody in that situation to yeah. to say, hey, you know what? This isn't as bad as I said. Yes. Um, yeah. Pro doesn't taste very good. So he's, I, yeah, <laughs> I think I think so. I think a lot of people painted themselves into a corner with that. Yeah, people are. Loath to admit they're wrong, right? Sure. Absolutely. Well, this was all videotaped, and it's going to be online, so you can see it next week. I'll trust science. Don't trust scientists. <laughs> oh, oh, one more thing. <laughs> you so should have said that. You may know that we all signed a website called 
Scientists for Science. Yes, we I don't did. know if anyone remembers. Oh, I remember that. I remember. sure do. And at the beginning of the meeting, <laughs> um, Carrie Wolinetz, who is very high up at uh, NIH, I don't know what her, what her title is, but she gave a talk to kind of introduce the thing, and she put the two groups, Cambridge, whatever it was, and Scientists for Sciences. She put, she said, these are the two opposite uh, opinions right. in this case. She, so she had ours and theirs up there. So I thought that was good. She gave us both. Uh, I, I think there's some people on both lists. Yeah, there are. Yeah. <laughs> Because you're there, talking about scientists, right? Yeah, so you ask yeah, yeah. five opinions. <laughs> That's right. yeah. No, no, I, totally, it's fine. But I don't Lord. look. I it's fine for you to have a stance if you don't like the experiments, but don't lie, don't exaggerate. That's all I ask. And these guys do that. I think they misrepresent the facts. They use hyperbole when it's not. I mean, a headline the government does, doesn't want you to know about. It's totally ridiculous. I found the the, the process was completely transparent, but. They went the numbers. And which newspaper was that? The Enquirer? No, no. That was the Washington Post. <laughs> but the actually. Washington Post yeah. said that? It was a respectable newspaper. I just shouldn't right. have allowed that. But anyway, so I wanted to let you know. I still, I'm committed. I mean, I get very passionate. I was very passionate yesterday about this. And a lot of people came up and thanked me for being a supporter. And I just, sometimes I wonder why I'm doing this because it, it's, it's stressful, right? Sure. <laughs> and I'm sure. not sure, but I, I have to do it because I'm passionate about science and I do not like when people don't represent it properly. So that's why I do it. I will continue to do it as long as I can. No, I, that's, your passion is uh, backed up by an intellectual... Uh, no, it's backed up by by all of us. Of course. I know that you, many of us feel the same way and... Uh, I appreciate that. No, no, no. You follow the rules. That's the point. You, you make an observation, then you make an hypothesis, and if you're right, it's going to bear fruit. And if it doesn't, you go to another one. Next. Keep doing it until you find out. Uh, Kathy, did you want to uh, yes, say yes. anything about ASV? <laughs> yes, because oh, yes. this coming Friday... Uh, back a back from to the top of the show. <laughs> right. This coming Friday, or a week from today that we're recording it, but Friday, January 31st, is the deadline for ASV abstracts. Mm. So uh, it's a day earlier than usual because it's Friday the 31st, and so uh, you need to get your abstract written and in. And as to whether we have a late-breaking session about 2019 novel coronavirus, that's not yet been decided. So <laughs> um, I'm hoping that we'll know something within this next week, but it's kind of up to the program committee. We've given them all the data, but it's more work for the program committee. You might remember we did it in 2016. We had some extra Zika virus uh, sessions, and we took abstracts for a longer time for those. So, get your abstract in, and then the following Monday is when travel award applications are due. So, you have to be a member to submit a travel award application, and so you need to uh, apply now for membership if you haven't done that, even before you work on your abstract and your <laughs> mem uh, travel application, get your membership done. That's it. And we'll talk more about the exciting things that are going to happen at the meeting in some subsequent weeks. So the abstract deadline is, is the 31st. Mm -hmm. hmm. I wonder if there will be some new coronavirus abstracts. Could be, right, oh, from yeah. China, right? Yeah. I mean, even, even in 2016, we did have um, a Zika virus abstract that came in by the deadline. But yeah. uh, that broke a little bit later relative to our abstract deadline than this is. So we could have some, but uh, yeah, stay tuned on that. Mm, it'll be interesting. Very yeah. cool. I want to just read two email. Um, they are right related. One is related to last episode 583 that we were all together. It's from Raihan. <coughs> And this is the, the uh, Raihan, who I met in Singapore, and I'll read it and you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Meeting you at the NEPA meeting, watching two TWIVs live and having lunch with you was an extreme 
surreal experience. I found the speed of things rather weird as I'm used to listening to Twiv at 1.5 X speed. <laughs> I guess you thought we were speaking slowly. Ha- having the chance to speak to you was really the highlight of my year. I can't begin to tell you how listening to Twiv pulled me through some rather hard times during my PhD. Thank you for bringing up my favoritist virus in the world in TWIV 582. You were discussing animal reservoirs of flu B or lack thereof, and Dixon mentioned in passing that it is primarily in birds. Did I say that? I'm writing to correct that. <laughs> flu B is not found in birds. And remember, the B of birds is capitalized. Yes. Flu B is only found in humans and certain marine animals naturally. I forwarded some papers here that document flu B isolated from seals in Scandinavia. Certain studies have shown that pigs and dogs are susceptible with a B, capital B, <laughs> to flu B infection as well. However, they don't seem to harbor <laughs> the virus naturally. So this is how I remember Raihan writing with capital B's. Yes. Mm-hmm. Remember a TWIV episode from way back when Peter Palazzi mentioned that flu B does not have an animal reservoir, and because of that, it should be the next possible virus to be eradicated. Let's hope that flu B from seals doesn't make epizootic jumps and that in time flu B will be wiped out just like small box. I'll be sad because I'll lose my baby, but it's for the betterment of the rest of us. I hope my emphasis tells you when there's a capital. <laughs> b- 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 best regards and b- b- best wishes, Raihan. So he listened because I said, I think there was this fellow I met in Singapore who, and there it is. So thank you, Raihan. Cool. And one more from our friend Johnny in Cambridge. Happy belated birthday from a fellow January 2nd birthday celebrant. I'd forgotten that. Happy birthday, Johnny. Let's raise a cheer for peace, sanity, and vaccines for preventable diseases. <laughs> Still listening and learning and enjoying the old and new members of Microbe TV's Pride of Podcasts. And she asks if she could get a 2019 Worldwide Tour t-shirt. Absolutely. It's just hot off the press. I have one right here. I don't think I've seen this yet. Oh, you haven't? Because I just got it uh, yesterday. So this is the same front as last year's. Dixon, you see that? But the back is our 2019 tour list where we went to a lot of places, starting with Iowa and ending in uh, Singapore. Uh, Steampunkphage.com. So Sharon Isern and... Florida designed it for us, and she has a website, steampunkphage.com. And it, you'll see a picture of the shirt, and you can stroll, scroll to the bottom. And um, depending on whether in the, you're in the U.S. or overseas, you can buy it at different places because Amazon U.S. doesn't ship elsewhere. It's so cool. You can buy it. And, of course, as everyone should know, when, I go to, when we go to do twivs on the road, we throw them out. Not in the garbage, but into the audience. Right. <laughs> so at ASV, we will throw some out and uh, any, everything in between. But if you don't want to wait for that, you could go. And the, pro- the, the proceeds go to Sharon. Good. And uh, Johnny ends by saying, wishing the best to all the Twiv, Twim, Twip, Twivo, Immune, and Twin hosts and their fearless leader. May the force and good health and funding stay with you. Thank you. Um. I, Johnny, I'm very impressed. You got them all. Our Cambridge pediatrician, yeah, um, who who Rich met uh, met right. Yeah, I had a nice uh, nice afternoon with Johnny. It was good fun. All right, let's do some picks to wrap it up. Oh, right. something new, Dixon. Picks of the week. <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't realize we should cover. I'm just kidding, you. Alan. What do you have for us? I have a plug-in for your browser, whether you use uh, Firefox or Chrome. I've provided two links. This is the library extension, and it is brilliant. I, I saw this thing someplace a couple of weeks ago, and I absolutely love it, um, as does everybody else. Apparently, it's got like five-star ratings with thousands of reviews on, on both browsers. So you put this thing into your browser. And when you're, um, uh, this happens to me a lot. Somebody will recommend a book or some link will recommend a book. And, and of course it's always an Amazon link and I go there and I'll say, eh, maybe I'll buy this. Maybe I won't. I'll bookmark it. And then I never get around to buying it or reading it or whatever. Um, this thing 
whenever you load a book page on Amazon, it adds a little additional frame to the, to the page showing the availability of that book in your local library. <laughs> oh. So you set it to your local library, and I, okay. my, my little <laughs> tiny town library was listed in their list. Um, he, and, and it'll tell you, you know, here's it, its, uh, its status at your local library. When you, uh, when you click on the link, if it's checked out, uh, you can, obviously, you're at your library's website, so depending on on uh, how they manage thing with things with mine, um, I can go there, and if it's checked out, I can put a hold on it, um, just log in and put a hold, and then when it shows up, my library sends me an email and says, your book's available, and I go and pick it up. Cool. It's very It's cool. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So. And it, it just does this for Amazon or any bookseller? Yeah. Just Amazon. Yeah. Which is a brilliant irony because Amazon has this this antisocial app for your smartphone where if you <laughs> see something in a brick and mortar store that you want, you can you can point your phone at it and, and it'll read the barcode and give you the Amazon link yeah, so you can yeah. buy it for less and undercut the price of all the brick and mortar stores. Mm. And this is it does the same thing to Amazon with books and it's just I love that aspect to it it's as well, cool. but mainly for just the convenience and the the loveliness of being able to pick this up at my local library. <laughs> nice. That's amazing what gets developed, right? Yes. I have a cool thing like this for next time, which is just computer programmers can do all kinds of cool stuff on the yeah. web. Rich, what do you have for us? They use their powers for good. Uh, Kathy gets uh, Kathy gets an assist for this pick because long assist. ago she told me uh, to make as my homepage the astronomy picture of the day, That's which right. I did. Mm -hmm. And um, oh man, and now I just lost uh, the <laughs> schedule. Here we are. So uh, my pick is from the uh, A pod picture from a couple of days ago, and it is me. We get it here. It is the Parker Solar Probe. Yeah. Colon sounds of the solar wind. Hmm. So uh, this is uh, like many a nested pick because you need to know what this Parker Solar Probe is. So I put in a link for that as well. The NASA site. This is a satellite that was launched in I think November of 2018, and. Uh, makes a uh, very lopsided elliptical orbit that goes around the sun and back around the earth uh, and is going to do so 23 times or so over the next several years. And its purpose is to study the sun. Yeah. And this particular uh, little video that I picked, The Sounds of the Solar Wind, um, has translated the uh, solar wind that this satellite experiences into sound, okay? So it's uh, artificial because it, what it is is particles from the solar wind impacting on detectors from this uh, probe. And there's different sorts of particles that impact in different ways, and so those have been uh, digitized in different fashions, so you hear different types of wind, and it's haunting what yeah. this thing is experiencing. And, but what I like about it the best is that <clears throat> and I couldn't see to what extent the time might be compressed or whether the thing is rotating. But during the course of this short video, you see the Earth and Jupiter and <laughs> Venus go by the screen. <laughs> and I just right. found that haunting. Mm -hmm. This Indeed. thing out there in space, okay, watching us and listening to the wind. <laughs> yep. yeah. So but, I thought but, it was pretty cool. I actually had uh, in my in my list of um, upcoming picks or potential picks for TWIV, the Parker Solar Probe was in there. There you go. Following this thing, mm. I, I I think solar astronomy is fascinating, and the, I agree. And the discoveries this thing is making are amazing. Uh, and this is, by the way, uh, for those who need things to be important, uh, the solar <laughs> wind and stuff from the sun has an enormous impact. Oh on, yeah, uh, and our experience, and so understanding. 
how all that stuff happens is important. And this, this machine is designed to do the appropriate research. Mm. Yeah. Cool stuff. Mm. Dixon, yeah. what do you have for us? Well, in my usual fashion, of course, since I'm uh, a, f- a rabid reader every morning of the Yahoo News, I do it for laughs, primarily. <laughs> every now and then, I run across something really interesting, and this is one of them. They had a contest for wildlife photography, but to see animals in a whole new light. Okay, so the first image is a leopard seal about to ingest an entire penguin in one gulp. It's a seal, huh? Mm. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's the biggest seal. These are, this is yeah. the seal that scuba divers are afraid to dive How with. How big is this seal? It's about 13 to 14 feet long. Poor, poor penguin. It's huge. Yeah, it's, their only, it's, their, it's their only food. <laughs> You're going to feel sorry for them if they don't eat penguins because then they'll go starving. Aww. Come on, there has to be. Can't the penguin like turn and get away? <laughs> yeah, many of them do. Good. Many of them. But, but the killer whales eat penguins too, right? Or seals. They actually eat seals. <laughs> they, great white sharks Great eat whites. Seals. Great whites, yeah. right? Correct. <laughs> Correct. So everything eats everything that can eat everything. So it's, it's, it's a big circle. So th- that's a stunning picture, though, because someone had to be down there to take it. And these are vicious animals. So the, the diver was taking Where a big chance. Where do these uh, big seals live? South, 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 Af- uh, South Pole. South Pole. South Pole. So then you see, you see these comedic pictures, too. The next one is of a squirrel. Says, you mean no. Antarctica. I meant, Sorry. didn't I? What did I just say? You said South Pole, which is pretty much landlocked. Oh, yeah. You should know that, shouldn't you? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I meant Antarctica. Exactly right. right. And you just scroll down these pictures and you can find some re- – you have to be there at the right time. That's what this says. And every one of these photographs are just absolutely stunning, including the one with the polar bear looking through the telescope at the camera looking at the polar bear. <laughs> Who got the award for that picture? <laughs> uh, yeah. And the dancing bears. You do remember uh, Ed Sullivan at all? And he would say something like, now for the children in the audience, bring out the dancing bears. And, and here they are. I've never seen dancing bears before, but who knew there were dancing bears? And then there are dancing monitor lizards and a yeah. grizzly bear that lost its way, it looks like. And two moose yep. discussing, I guess, what's going to happen at the evening meeting at the <laughs> moose club. Uh, just remarkable pictures. Uh, proof cool. the, the rhinoceros yeah. though with the, <laughs> the with the peacock rear end is fantastic think these are all real yeah they're all real they're not this, fake. Is a, this is a dodgy site this yahoo you know, you know no, <laughs> tell me about that i mean the ads are yeah. ridiculous or yeah. horrible so i see the one you said now the little the polar bear cub on the back end of the adult <laughs> yeah that's cute they're, they're, they're all they're all picked because they're Dixon, a, why, they're don't you t- why don't you take pictures like this are, are, that's a i don't have enough time you have enough this. you have a nice one of a cow in a dark river in india that's very cool i, do. I like I do. that one thank you thank you but it's not funny like these no i don't have any funny yeah. kathy what do you have i picked the uh it's a from the blog post of a faculty member here incomplete list of things that blow the minds of introductory biology <laughs> students this is good and, um uh <laughs> she starts out with an xkcd comic but um things like Almost all of your cells contain all of your genes. That blows their mind. <laughs> or uh, that plants respire. Or right. uh, things about damselfly penises. Or um, things about fecal transplants. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she gets into <laughs> some more serious... Those are factoid kinds of things. And then she gets into sort of concept kind of things. And then people have added all kinds of comments, such as... <laughs> Goldfish are more closely related to humans than they are to sharks. Um, you know, just all kinds of really fun things that. Uh, this is great. Yeah. You know, you run into some of them just teaching introductory virology, but you can imagine the breadth of <laughs> things that could be introduced in an intro bio course. Dude, so. Very cool. Dude. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, this is good. <laughs> all right. I have, I have a pick and an anti pick. Anti pick. A pick, my pick is uh, Mosquito pho- Photographs by Alex yeah, Wild. That's, that's a wonderful pick. I stumbled across quite a while ago looking for a photo of he a mosquito. He is an amazing no, that's a great photographer. Great, great Very good stuff. And um, he, has, he has other insects there as well. Oh, yeah. Yes. But, um, they, he calls he's, them, he is the uh, master of macro <clears throat> photography. He's got great stuff. Scale-covered flies, Dixon. I know. 
No, no. I, 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 so they're beautiful. And they have some mosquito gorgeous. science. There's Leslie Vosshall at, at Rockefeller, who we tried to get on TWIP. Mm-hmm. We'll keep and then a researcher who puts her hand in and gets all tons of mosquito bites on <laughs> To feed the These are amazing. They, they are. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah they very are. nice. All right, and then my anti-pick, which means I don't actually like it, but it should be mentioned. This is, you know, I have this, everybody has their local newspaper, right? Mm-hmm. We Patch. Do. We, or maybe patches everywhere, but we have one locally. And there's an article here on hepatitis A cases in Union County, which is where I live, which is a lot of hep A. Um mm. 576 cases since last year and seven deaths, right? Which is crazy um, because there is a vaccine for it, but I don't, I'm not even vaccinated because it's not considered a risk here, but some countries that you travel to, you should get it. But apparently here in Union County, (laughs) if you eat in certain places, these are foodborne typically. Anyway. Yeah. The, the problem is that... Is picture, see my raw oysters reference up above. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the picture is totally wrong. You know, they bought a picture from Shutterstock oh, of, of bacteria. Right. Rod, rod-like bacteria. That's right. Which, well, I mean, look. That makes good sense. You don't have to be brilliant, <laughs> but if you just paid attention in biology, uh, a bacterium is... And it's probably labeled bacteria in Shutterstock. Yeah. I don't know. Could be labeled virus. Yeah, you're right. Uh, it might be labeled virus. Yeah, and they look false colored. They might be real, but they yeah. they look they like cheese look, sticks. They do look cheese colored. Sticks. Yes, so they're falling from the sky like if you turned over a bag of <laughs> Cheetos, <laughs> right? Like they do yeah. in the commercials. Yeah. And um, I was going to make a comment, say nicely, you know, this isn't really Hepe, and I could send you a picture of Hepe, but I'd have to give them my email. I said that's it. I'm done. Yeah. Which they already have because I get these in by email. <laughs> So why do I have to give my email? So it's an anti-pick, which means, um, what does it mean? It means I disagree with it. I want. I don't think it's great because mm-hmm. most of the time we we do picks, we think things are cool, right? Mm-hmm. Right. But so that's an anti-pick. And uh, I think I have a listener pick, but I didn't put it in. Where is it? Uh, here, Justin. Let me let me paste it in. Uh, it's from Justin. Oh, this is pretty funny. It's a, it's a little news article here. Justin. <laughs> this is very funny. Oh, yes. Yada, yada, yada virus. Yes. Scientists named new virus after a sign. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, cool. Yada, I hadn't yada, seen yada. that. What, ah. uh, they extracted RNA from a number of mosquitoes in Australia and found a new alpha virus. So now it's the yada yada virus. Yep, right. yada, yada, Discovering yada. a new alpha virus in mosquitoes is not exactly newsworthy. So to get that point across, they called it yada yada virus. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Justin. All right. That is TWIF 584. Uh, if you want to find the papers and links we mentioned, you have to go to microbe.tv slash TWIV. It's a website. You could do that on your phone. You don't need to mm-hmm. sit at a computer. Most of you listen on a podcast player, we would love you to subscribe. Just push a button, subscribe. It's free. You get every episode. We know how many people are listening. And if you want to send us questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv, we'd love to hear from you. We really do. And and if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Palmiers at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. Sorry I was late. You have a class on I do. Friday, I do. Right? Yeah, that's Architecture gonna... for biologists? No, ecology for designers. Oh, well, it's close, <laughs> right? <laughs> hmm, ecology for designers. <laughs> yeah, that's a good class. Kathy there. Spindler is at the University of Michigan, which is in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit, Meredith Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com on Twitter. He's Alan Dove. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Our guest today was Ralph Barrick. You know, yesterday about 2 p.m., I thought, we should have a guest, uh, a coronavirologist tomorrow. Yeah. Good idea, because that was good. And I said, well, Ralph is probably busy. And uh, I emailed him and... His assistant immediately said he rearranged his schedule for you. Neat. It was yeah, booked all awesome. afternoon. So thank you, Ralph. 
It was great. Yes. Really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And uh, obviously, Ralph knows what I mean. He knows his stuff. All the yeah. things, just about everything he said, I wouldn't have said. Right. I don't know it. Right. Rich, I was at a at your university yes uh, last week. Oh. And I got to meet your president. Oh. Because the right. uh, and he knows you. Beat he, me up. he knew you. He, he, said, he, come on. he said he, said yeah, he did. He said he did. Yeah. Boy, that's hard to believe. No, well, <laughs> his last name is, I think, Fox. Is that true? Oh, 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 you were at UF. Yes. Okay. Yes, UF. Uh, oh, yeah, what? Fox. I don't. Uh, he I must have known know you when you retired. Yeah, Maybe. he knows him because he doesn't have to pay him anymore. Exactly. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Who am I saving? He doesn't get his overhead on. anymore either, though. <laughs> cool. That yeah, was a good meeting. It was a good meeting. Did I say I was Vincent Racaniello? And you can find me at virology.ws. I want you just to, did. I want to thank ASV and ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for his music. This episode was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Whoa, 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 why Corona? I have to tell you one last quick story. This past week, both my son and daughter texted me and said, hey, dad, have you heard of this coronavirus? <laughs> Which wow. kind of wow. made me sad. Yeah. <laughs> now yes. they know what you do. Of course he has. <laughs> so well, sad. <laughs> Vincent, so it was my second week of class, but uh, it was Monday, January 13th for the current events, virus in the news, I said, how many of you have heard about this virus causing pneumonia in Japan, in China? And out of the 50 students, one. Wow. Right. One. Uh, right. wow. So, I mean, yeah, that was, you know, that was a week ago, but um, Still. I wanted to say, oh, I guess it's not on Facebook yet. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, That's right. But I didn't say it. I think right. uh, they don't do Facebook. They do other things. No, it's true. I should. It's not on Instagram yet. <laughs>